Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Thomas More Catholic Chapel and Center at Yale University. I'm Father Ryan Lerner, the chaplain here at St. Thomas More, and I'm so happy to welcome all of you to join us this evening for what will be a fascinating event. Tonight, we have nearly, it's my understanding, we have nearly over 100 people joining us from all over the world for this discussion. Before we begin, I thought we'd begin with a little prayer and ask for God's presence and grace to guide our conversation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, please give us the ideas that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and no mind has imagined. The root of creativity lives in you, who are the source of all goodness, truth, and beauty. Please give us the creativity to recognize you and to respond to your plan for our lives in accord with your providence, your wisdom, and your love. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, this semester, we've been exploring the lives of the saints, and tonight, we have a very special guest to join our conversation. Ruben Ferreira is an artist currently working in London. His paintings capture the saints at their most human, intimate, and beautiful moments. And while grounded in tradition, he brings a thoroughly contemporary flair to his work. And so now, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome Ruben Ferreira. Thank you for joining us tonight, Ruben. <laughs> Thank you, Father Ryan. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a joy to be here and have this conversation. And uh, if we can take something positive from the times that we are living, it's this closeness um, from across the pond uh, that perhaps in, in other times wouldn't be as easy. Uh, although it's awkward, this virtual format that we have to speak, uh, I'm more nervous because of the of speaking virtually than <laughs> for speaking at all. But uh, hopefully, we will all be able to listen and to follow, um, and well, and help God to enter in our lives uh, through art and beauty and the lives of the saints as well. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Ruben. And on that note, we certainly uh, invoke the presence and the prayers and the support of the saints who we know accompany us on this journey through life. And so on that note, I would ask Ruben, how have the saints influenced your personal faith journey? Well, I would say that I wouldn't have a faith uh, without the saints. Uh, I was not raised a Catholic. Um, I did my first Holy Communion when I was 15 years old, and it was my own choice then. Uh, so although my parents actually transmitted me all the good values, but they were not practicing Catholics. Um, although I have some issues with the term, but it's a very often a very common term that we use, at least in Portugal. Um, but I, I was baptized when I was uh, one year old, but was only later in life that I started my own my own quest for who God was. Uh, and that quest started because of the saints. And I will always be deeply grateful for them. Uh, so it was a way for God to reach out for my heart. And I remember, uh, I have to mention a particular person, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. It may sound like a cliche, but it was, it was really her that touched my heart the first time. I remember being a teenager and back then we didn't have um, Netflix or Instagram or <laughs> any other apps. Uh, so I was just in the couch uh, doing nothing and I was just changing, uh, I was just zapping and a movie was about to start and it was a movie about Mother Teresa. And by the end of the movie, I remember I was completely struck down by this feeling that something else was out there. And I remember going to ask my mom about Mother Teresa and my mom wasn't even sure if she was still alive or not. So I started my own research. Uh, so I would say that Mother Teresa was my first step uh, to, through in the direction of God. And it's funny because she always said 
that if she would become a saint, um, she would be the saint uh, walking in the darkness uh, to, to, to help people there. And I think I was in a kind of a dark place when she found me. Um, I say a dark place because bullying was a reality for me in school. It wasn't easy. Uh, I'm not going to start the conversation in such a gloomy way, uh, but yes, bullying was a reality and uh, suffering, now I understand suffering in a different way. Although suffering is what puts people off believing God because what God is this that allows suffering is also through suffering that we seek God or we seek something else for our lives. And while I was being bullied, uh, I, I was seeking for something else. I was seeking for comfort. And the saints came along, uh, uh, came along in this path. I remember even, um, I found recently a note that I wrote uh, to Jesus at that time, asking him to make me invisible. Imagine. So it was actually the first dialogue I had with Jesus, asking for him to make me invisible. Um, but this was actually good. We started a dialogue, a loving dialogue, I would say. But in Portugal, you have saints everywhere. You have beautiful churches. Uh, you have beautiful panels, paintings, statues. And art was also something that would uh, was already part of my life, was something that always made me feel alive. So me exploring the churches in Portugal alongside this seed that God put in my heart made me raise more and more questions. I would arrive home and ask my mom or my dad, who is this saint? Why does he have arrows in his chest? I was speaking about Saint Sebastian, for example. Oh, why did that saint lost the head? Or <laughs> Why are these people dying for Jesus? Why? <laughs> who is this Jesus? So obviously, they were the ones who started uh, drawing me closer to Jesus. Um, they help us to balance this unworthy feeling that we all have. We all feel unworthy of approaching God. Uh, but looking at the saints, they encourage us to keep going because they were unworthy as well, but that didn't put them off reaching higher and deeper into God's love. It's like a marathon. So you will have your friends cheering up for you. Come on, come on, run, run. <laughs> so I wouldn't run. I don't do any exercise. The only exercise I do is walking with, with the Lord every day. But <laughs> I, do, I, I, I had to do this comparison. Um, because at a certain point, I had a difficulty in, because I'm very funny uh, and uh, uh, I'm always making a joke and uh, I can't avoid it. And I thought, um, I can't be saint like this. I can't, I have to be serious. I have to be more serious. Um, and I, I will speak about that further on, but because I understand that in the United States, you have a different, a cultural frame, but in Portugal and Spain and Italy, uh, uh, the devotion to the sorrows of the Lord, they are very intricate in our spiritual life. It seems that we have to be very serious practicing, practicing our faith. It seems that laughter and joy doesn't come into the spiritual life. So I had a problem there. How can I keep growing in my faith where this presents an obstacle. So thank God I read the book of Father James Martin, um, the Between Heaven and Mirth. I think that's the translation for English and actually helped me a lot. So, wow, well, this spiritual life can actually be funny and uh, it can actually be uplifting. It's what we want, isn't it? It's what God is and what Jesus is as well. And I always remember a sentence uh, that says, uh, if you are deadly serious, you are seriously dead. So <laughs> I always try to have that in my mind so I won't forget and I won't take myself too seriously. And St. Teresa of Avila, an amazing saint, uh, she's walking with me since the beginning as well. 
uh, she often says very funny sentences. She has, she has one that says, I'm more afraid of an unhappy nun than a crowd of evil spirits. Uh, <laughs> so I always try to keep that in mind. So again, uh, I wouldn't have a, a, a life of faith without the saints. And although I feel much, much closer to Jesus now, they are always there uh, like stars in, in the night to guide me. And they come and go according to what God wants to tell me in that specific moment of my life. Uh, so, um, for example, it's not that, it's actually a relationship. It's a, re a personal relationship, and that will reflect in my work. Wow, <laughs> that's um, beautiful, Ruben. What, a, what an amazing start to this conversation. Um, I've already profoundly moved, thank you. Your paintings are very contemporary and, and deeply human. And now having heard you speak a little bit, I can, I can see what, you know, why that is in a way that this is through the saints and um, God reached out to your heart, you know, obviously in a deeply human way. How did you arrive at this particular approach? Um, the birth of Jesus is something that really brings emotion to me. When I look at him as a baby, I always think to myself, if I was God, the last place I would like to go, it's earth. It, it's our world. It, it would be the last place I would like to go, <laughs> especially 2000 years ago. And he came, he made himself flesh just to be with us. And he went through all the hardship uh, that we know out of love. And quite often in tradition, we like to put God away from us, from our humanity. I don't think we are doing it intentionally, but it's happening. It happened throughout these ages of, of tradition. In art, in sculpture, we look at Jesus in a very formal way. Even when you go to churches and or museums and you see paintings of um, Jesus and the apostles or the disciples, it, I would think immediately, I don't want to belong to this group. Uh, they don't look very happy at all. <laughs> They, they look like they are in trouble, so I won't actually engage with them because I think I don't think it's for me. And when we see the reason Lord uh, portrayed, he, he looks upset most of the times. What is the joy? Where is actually the joy of belonging to this group? Uh, to be to be closer to Jesus, <laughs> and and this goes not just from paintings or or or, or sculptures even music, liturgies, uh, celebrations, sometimes they are everything but a celebration. Uh, even it's some Easter Sundays, uh, some uh, Sunday mass, uh, we go to mass and when it's the gospel acclamation, you have the priest coming to read the gospel and he says, Alleluia, Alleluia, the Lord is risen, rejoice. <laughs> and then he carries on. If I was a stranger, I would say, well, <laughs> does this guy actually believe that Jesus is reason or it's just me? It's <laughs> so all these questions should make us reflect on how we are living our faith, how we are transmitting our faith to others. And in my particular case, how, I, how am I portraying the saints? or Jesus. Um, so being human is actually the point of contact between God or Jesus and the saints with us. And sometimes we try to make them something they weren't. Especially if you look to Middle Ages saints, we try to hide their, uh, their 
uh, their faults, we try to hide their sins, we try to make them something they are not or they were not. We are trying, we try to oversell it and it's not a good way, <laughs> not in a good way. It's because it's, the, it's, their, it's their fragility that speaks to us today. I do love Dorothy Day and I did a portrait of her when I discovered more about her life. I had to paint her. And uh, her painting is, is not one of my most perfect paintings or portraits. It's a very rough in the edges. Uh, but at a certain point, I started to see people already looking at the painting, friends coming over, looking at the painting and saying, wow, this painting is amazing. And I was looking at it, but no, it's not even finished. But I left it like it was because it was rough, rough like her own life. And it was actually that that spoke to me. And I wouldn't be afraid to, to go and speak to her uh, once I'm in heaven. I would be afraid of Padre Pio because it would slap me, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but not Dorothy Day. So, and I love them both. Um, but I would go for Dorothy Day to have a very sincere, honest, open conversation without being afraid of her in heaven. Hopefully I will meet her there one day. So, and I started to realize that portraying humanity would bring people closer to God. So the rough edges on Dorothy Day already made people stop and look at her. In this painting here in the back, I'm going to give another example. Some people think when I'm in conferences for the local hospital I work to uh, as well, when we are in conferences, they think, oh, what a nice background on Zoom. No, it's not, it's actually a painting that goes to Portugal, hopefully uh, during the summer. And I did this Mary, it's the coronation of the Virgin Mary. Um, not my own, because sometimes I'm like this, <laughs> it seems that I'm being the one coronated, it's not, it's Mary. And um, we chose this model, it's, it's a friend, a very dear friend from the parish. Um, and obviously we didn't look for a young model because it was by the end of the life of Mary when she encountered Jesus in heaven. And some people made comments about her wrinkles um, not that they didn't like, but they were surprised by them. Some people actually really enjoyed and shared with me that they were having problems. Um, they were struggling with their process of getting old, with their own wrinkles. But when they saw Mary with wrinkles, they reconciled themselves with their process of getting older. And I thought, oh my God, I don't control that father. <laughs> I don't. And this is what is amazing in art is no one owns art. God is the only and ultimate artist. Uh, and he speaks to people in different ways. So if we can if we can give them means, give him means to speak, I will do it. Um, so he has wrinkles in the saints, it's something that is speaking to people. Why? Because they can see their own struggles in God in the saints and they can have this encounter. So I believe that art before, they were teaching us stuff about God. Now art has to go a little bit deeper. It's no longer to portray a distant and cold God. We have to show his humanity, to show our humanity in him, to make art sacred art, a place of encounter, a place where I can see my life, where I can see that I belong. I'm not just a spectator to the Bible stories. I can actually be on those stories with Jesus. And that's why I think I, I portray them in such a human way. And we, we quite often do the things the opposite way. We try to tell people that Jesus loves them so much that he dies for them. And that's so true. But if people don't know Jesus, they won't understand the depth of his love, of his death in the cross. How can we bring people to his encounter? How can we bring people closer to them, to Jesus and to the saints without putting obstacles beforehand 
because sometimes often we do it sometimes we say we are not worthy and none of us are but you have to follow a set of rules to make you <laughs> a little bit less unworthy so then you can join the club or you can join the group of jesus but we are doing the things around come and see come and feel the love of god and this it's this love that will actually change lives it's not the rules or the tradition although they are important but it's not this that changes lives obviously if we feel the love of god we will then understand the rules and the tradition and we will follow them in a different way so what we what i want to say and just to, just to terminate uh, uh, this question it's tradition is very important the tradition how uh, that that we follow in art sacred art liturgy uh, religion it's important but you should never put limits to the almighty you should never put limits to the way we are open to the news of god because if he's inspiring us or showing us new or something different we shouldn't tell him to go back into a box <laughs> we should actually try to listen and to understand um we wouldn't question god we we can question our interpretation of god because we in the end we are all students uh, we will we will not know everything uh, so we are all learning and we are all walking together so my question is isn't god allowed to do new things he is so let's walk to the path of tradition because it's the good way but always with our eyes and our heart in god open to the unexpected uh, and that's that's why i'm doing things in a different way not to cut but to be open to what is unexpected and that's why perhaps people are enjoying it so much some not at all <laughs> but if we speak about thomas i will mention that <laughs> Thank you. Ruben, how, how do you determine who or what you're going to paint? Um, well, for me, painting is never a, a solitary process. It's always a dialogue uh, with the transcendent, with the divine. It comes from a personal relationship, if it makes sense. And this personal relationship comes from prayer. So if I read a book um, and I met, for example, Cardinal Van Tuan, he's a Vietnamese Cardinal. He has an amazing book, Five Lobes and Two Fishes, where he speaks about his life in prison in Vietnam. After I read that book, I was transformed and I had to paint him. It's that feeling, it, it, comes, from, uh, it comes from my guts, it comes from the inside. Uh, it, I needed to put out there, I needed to make it visible what I see already in my heart. It comes from a relationship. It happened with Cardinal Van Tuan. It happened with the portrait I did of Pope John Paul II. Um, if, you, if you see on my social media, he is holding the cross. Uh, and it was in a, in a particularly difficult time uh, in my life where I felt closer to him in prayer. And that is the result of that battle. Um, it, that is the portrait that came out of it. But we're, it looks like we've lost uh, Ruben for just a moment. We'll wait and see if he logs back on. So please be patient. Great, thank you, Ruben, we got you back. I was just saying, uh, what, a, what a beautiful gift that we can come together across land and sea. Um, but of course, not without a little bit of technical difficulty, the wrinkles and the fragility, right? So <laughs> please go ahead and pick up uh, where you left off. So where, where, what was the last thing uh, you heard <laughs> you were talking about um painting pope john paul ii and holding the cross and how that was a particularly it was at a particularly difficult time and then at about that point things started to to get something like that <laughs> it, must have doesn't been that. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me so yes here i am again back so i'm more again i say i'm more nervous because of these technologies than give me an auditory full of people i won't be nervous i love to speak but it's the technology that i'm always afraid because it doesn't depend on us all the time um so but good to be back 
<laughs> so I gave people a break from my voice. Uh, so yes, John Paul II, and he came from that struggle. Uh, so the idea is that always comes from a personal relationship, a personal encounter, a, a personal experience. I remember uh, going to bed one night, I was already closer to St. Francis of Assisi, and uh, I had a clear image of, after my prayers, I had a clear image of what I had to, to paint. So I remember coming to my studio, doing a quick scratch, a sketch, and in the morning I started a painting. It had to be made. Uh, and uh, he found its way to Texas, in the United States again. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, I was very happy for that. And then I mentioned the um, Silent Night painting. So I did a painting of a nativity scene and I was trying to hold myself back on that uh, advent thinking, no, I won't do another Christmas painting, but I couldn't. I had to do something. I had to paint Mary, Joseph and Jesus. It's such a loving scene. And I did it in one week only. So I was rushing doing it, but I had to put it outside. It's something I don't control all the time. That's why I appreciate um, the compliments people made me. Uh, and I do thank everyone for the support people actually do give me on social media. Uh, but I, I have always this feeling that I don't work alone. I, I have, I may want to do something, Father, and sometimes it happens, I really want to do, I really want to do Mary, but I don't find a way to do it, or I don't find the right model, or I don't find the right position, but then something else will come up, and then I will do Carlo Acutis, for example. I don't plan, so I try to compromise with God <laughs> sometimes. I have to do more of what he wants, and sometimes I will do more of what I want. But if I don't do it with him, it won't land as well. <laughs> so I learn how to trust and to surrender to whatever he sends in my direction. <laughs> Amen. And so what was what was compelling about Carlo Acutis to to make you want to paint him or or perhaps that that God introduced him to you, you know, through this process? You know, what was it that that drew you to him? Yeah. So let me try to share the, the painting. Uh, let me try to do that now. So everyone can actually see um, the painting. Can you see, Father? Okay, so I hope everyone else can see as well. So I remember first hearing about Carla Cutis when I was still a teacher of religious studies in Portugal. And uh, uh, I came across his life because I was looking for saints that could actually serve as role models for um, teenagers, for young people. Uh, so I remember collecting a few saints. Pierre Giorgio Frassati was there, uh, a great saint, a great brother in heaven, because he was actually a very funny saint as well. So every time I feel bad for a joke, I will always ask his direction. <laughs> Pierre Giorgio Frassati is just amazing. Um, Chiara Luce as well, it's one amazing girl um, as well, full of joy. And I was searching for at least one saint in order to divide the class in different groups. So I was looking for more, I had about six. And then I found Carla Cutis. He was just recently, he re just recently passed uh, away, uh, but I decided to involve him in the discussion as well. And I remember seeing a couple of students stopping by his photo in the school hall, uh, because he was he's quite modern. He's a quite modern saint. So this is the first time I remember Carla Cutis in my life. Then he was also very close to Fatima. So when I googled his photos, I could we can see photos of him in Fatima in Portugal. And uh, for any Portuguese person, I think that Fatima will always have a special place in our hearts. Um, so seeing Carla Cutis there in Fatima actually made me feel closer to him. I said, oh, how cool is this? We just had a saint coming to visit Portugal, not just Fatima, but other places there as well. How cool is this? Um, amazing. So I felt closer to him. 
And I remember one year in Fatima, we had an exhibition about the Eucharist, and we could actually see his backpack and his rosary in display in that exhibition. And I remember feeling quite moved. I remember kneeling in the middle of the exhibition uh, and I was just there looking at a backpack. It's something so vulgar, isn't it? Because everyone has one, but that one is, was special because it was his and the rosary as well. So I felt that connection with him again through the humanity, through simple things from life. It's what actually connects us to God and to the saints again. So I remember that episode quite clear in my life. So I was always following um, Carlos, uh, Carla Cutis, who was always in my life for some reason or another. But on the day of his beatification, it was very, it was very emotional. Uh, I remember, again, because we have uh, this social distance, we could actually watch the beatification without being in, in Assisi. I, and I visit Assisi and I visit that uh, cathedral of St. Francis, and it's full of tradition. The paintings are amazing. The frescoes are amazing. It's such, it, it, it's a place full of history. It really touches our hearts. And suddenly seeing Carlo's photo there being displayed for his beatification, I thought, my God, the church is actually alive. Uh, and it's, it's the church of our days. It's, it's, it's happening now. It's with this young lad that uses the, the internet. He loved to use computers. How amazing is this? Is this in that context all felt so special that from that moment I thought I had to do a painting of Carla Cutis. So really, when God wants us to do something, He unsettled our hearts, isn't it, Father? When He wants actually uh, to take us somewhere, He will put something in our heart to unsettle us, so we will reach where He wants us, and um, eventually. I made this painting. I had a lot of people asking questions about the painting and I always had the plan to make a video to explain it. It's, it's not very complex. It has a few uh, details for me it can be different from you or from anyone seeing the painting. But some people, some, someone asked me why I portrayed Carlo in black. So he's, he's, he's using a training suit I think it's a way to show that he was quite young and he loved sports, um, opposite to me, <laughs> but he loved sports. And I wanted to do it in black because he's not calling the attention to himself. That was not the point of his life. All his life was to call attention to God. And uh, that's why I made it in black. I also made him barefoot because I think that Carlo was very down to earth. He never lost contact with his friends, with his family, in school. He always knew to be in the world and taking the world a step further to the heart of God in the Eucharist. So I wanted to make him barefoot because it also symbolizes his humility and simplicity of living and also being down earth. So we, we know that he was, uh, he was always very caring for colleagues that were suffering bullying in school, for example. We know that he was paying attention to those details. Uh, and this is something that young people may dismiss most of the time. So he was very, he was very down to earth. And obviously I had to do a PlayStation uh, remote control I think this is what shocked people the most. And I had a lot of people coming over and saying, what does that mean? Who is he? And it starts a conversation, Father. Seeing a saint with a PlayStation in his hands starts a conversation. And that's what we want to do with Sacred Heart. We want to start a dialogue. It's how we start allowing God in our lives. If we start dialogue, uh, if we start chatting with him allowing him to get closer. So I think it's a, 
an amazing starting point for a conversation, a PlayStation in a saint's hand. But then obviously you have the construct of the, the contrast of the Eucharist behind him, because it was always part of his life. Uh, and I think that in general, it makes a very um, different and beautiful composi composition. I, I, I'm not afraid to say it's beautiful because quite often I stop to the, near the painting and I, I stare at the painting and I, I, I just, <laughs> just sometimes don't know how the painting got there, <laughs> you know? Sometimes I just look at it and say, well, this is actually very good. I don't ask me how I did it, but it's actually very good. Uh, so we did very, we did a good work together, I would say, uh, me and the Holy Spirit <laughs> and Carlos as well. Um, so yes, this is, this is in a nutshell, what I can say about Carlo and how he entered my life and how this painting appeared. Beautiful. Um... You know, the, the, something that very that comes clear certainly is this exuberance and joy in your work, in, in addition to the utter humanity of it. Where does this come from? Um, I think that it may sound like a cliche, but first of all, it comes from Jesus. Uh, it comes from his love, from me feeling loved, deeply loved, even unworthy. But it's not our unworthiness that stops God from reaching out. He will always come. Doesn't matter who you are, he will always be there. So when we say and when we try to explain people that we are all unworthy, we have to tell them, bear in mind that it wasn't that that stopped God before and we'll never stop him to come. So it's this overflowing love from him that actually makes me happy. Uh, and you can, you can feel his love in so many things. You can feel his love through a loving partner, family, friends, um, even my dog, <laughs> even the nature around us. In these times of spring, everything is filled of beauty. The problem is we start looking. When we look for God, we think we have to look for great things. And we for forget that God also reveals himself in the smaller things in our lives, even if it's just someone smiling to us. So I think that paying attention to those small gestures of love from him towards me makes me want to share this happiness with others. So I try to tell people that having God in our lives actually makes us joyful, not because we are free from sorrows or free from troubles, we do have them. And sometimes in a very intense way, but we are always sure that we are never alone. And God is always with us, trying to cheer us up with these small things, the small blessings that we have in life. Especially now in these times that we lived in, it's very easy to get into despair, uh, into depression. And I, and well, I, we, it's normal for us to start complaining about everything, to moan about everything. So I started to try to do an exercise. For each moan, I would say, I will try to count five blessings. <laughs> and eventually this put me off of moaning so much. <laughs> Obviously things would be different if I wouldn't have my morning coffee. You, me without a morning coffee, this it's not the reality I face. <laughs> Everything goes very dark. So God's love and the morning coffee and <laughs> everything else will fall into place. <laughs> I totally hear that. <laughs> you can almost put it on a coffee mug. All I need is God's love and my morning coffee. Right on. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I understand there's, a, there's another painting you're going to show us tonight. 
uh, Ruben, um, yes. and that is the, the painting of St. Thomas. Could you tell us yes. about that, please? Let me share Thomas as well. So this is, um, uh, wait, it's taking a long, uh, can you already see the painting, Father? Yes, good. I will show you like this. Um, so this is perhaps one of my um, uh, popular paintings, okay? Definitely it's one of the most popular paintings. Um, I, I've been selling prints of some of my artworks. Thomas is in the lead with 90% of the prints being of his portrait. 90% <laughs> of all my prints is Thomas. My parents, even my parents stop asking what kind of print am I sending now to the United States because usually it's always Thomas. <laughs> uh, and I don't even know, I, I did this painting in 2017. I started this painting in 2017. Uh, eventually I dropped it uh, and I just picked it up a few a few months or a year perhaps later and I just decided to finish just for the sake of finishing a painting. But when I did this painting, uh, um, I think I started this painting during Easter and I was reflecting on Easter Sunday and on the, on the readings that we do on, those, uh, on, uh, on Easter and a couple of weeks later when we speak about Thomas. Um, <laughs> I don't want to make a generalization, but um, Latin people, uh, we, we, we tend to be more late than others <laughs> to arrive to certain events. <laughs> I can tell that now because I'm living in London and British people are spot on to arrive on time. <laughs> so when we book a dinner, a dinner or a lunch, uh, we, we book a lunch for one, PM, thinking that people will arrive at two, but at 1 PM, they are knocking at our door and we are still doing lunch. <laughs> we are still doing the food, preparing the food. <laughs> so we learned the hard way. So I always naturally uh, delay myself arriving to places. And I, I, on that occasion, I remember I relate a lot with Thomas because it seems that he arrived late, although we know that he arrived actually on time for this to happen, but he arrived late. And if I was Thomas, I would be gutted so Jesus appeared to all of you and I just missed that. How is that possible? So I just tried to put it myself in the scene. And I came across with this expression. This would be the expression I would make if my dearest friend that was killed in a horrible way was dead for sure and was laid in the tomb would appear reason full of life full of flight, full of joy, I would have this face, wouldn't you, Father? <laughs> I, I, I think that's why we relate to this painting so much, because it's actually a very human expression. I would make this expression if this would happen to me. So suddenly, suddenly we are there with the risen Christ because we see ourselves in the apostles, in the disciples. And when I see myself there, I allow God to transform my life, to touch my heart. And actually this painting comes as, as the other extreme uh, from what I was saying before. When you look at paintings or, or uh, stained glasses, or you always see Jesus reason, not very happy, and you see the apostles looking at Jesus like, no big deal. <laughs> but it was actually a big deal. That's why we get so used to the narrative of Easter and the narrative of the risen Lord that we stop allowing ourselves from being surprised again and again but we should never allow that to happen. We should never allow the surprise of God's love to come to our lives. And 
this for me is such a loving place being able to see ourselves there with Jesus, dialoguing, having a dialogue with him. That I don't understand why people react so negatively to this painting as well. So Father James Martin, he actually shared this painting on Twitter. And well, I thank him because he was the one that started to promote this painting in a more wider <laughs> scale. And the backlash I received the first time he shared this painting was horrible. I had some terrible comments, people calling me an heretic, I should be away from the church, I should be ashamed of myself, because I just portrayed um, an apostle in such an ungodly way. And this made me reflect why are people reacting this way to such a simple painting. Uh, again, when I did this painting was not having any of this in mind. I just did it because I felt I had to. So I never expect any positives or negatives, to be honest. So I was not prepared to see the impact that this simple painting had in their lives. So it made me wonder, why are these people actually reacting so negative in such a negative way? People often put God as part of their lives, as going to school, as going to work, uh, as having family. We also have God there in a niche in our family, in that box. So we keep God in there through what we believe God is and what we believe we are to God. So sometimes even touches superstition. So I, all, everything I do, is because I always did things this way and I still have that box, I tick that box. Yes, I have faith God is there to protect me, to safeguard everything I own and all of that. But we make sure it doesn't come too close <laughs> because if God comes too close, then it means that I will have to change my life because there is no way that with God in our lives, we will be the same. <laughs> so actually it's more comfortable to leave God in a corner, in a box, in a way that he wouldn't um, bring different stuff into my life, different things, different challenges. People quite often don't like to grow or to be challenged and it's what actually God does. So I think that that's why people reacted so in such a negative way. But we have to bear in mind that fear alone, fear of the of things that are different ensures that we remain enable to grow. We remain enable to be surprised by God. So why would people be shocked for seeing such a human face uh, in, uh, in such a remarkable apostle? This way we can see ourselves as well in there. And I think this way we, we allow God to come to our hearts in a reasoned way. In, and look that Thomas is looking to ourselves directly. So in a way, he's telling us that the reason Lord, the reason Jesus abides in her, in our, in, in us, in ourselves. <laughs> so we are the Jesus in this picture because he's looking directly at us because God is alive and reason in our hearts. Ruben, my gosh, I just, uh, I, I was just thinking all, like, oh, I'm looking at this, this image of Thomas and hearing you talk us through that. It's just how powerful, how so powerful that is experiencing that gospel again and realizing that yes, he truly has risen. Like this is a joyful event. And, and I felt it, you know, I could, I could feel goosebumps, you know, in Thomas's shoes there. <laughs> and then that part at yeah. the end, you know, that we as the beholder are bearers of the risen Christ. And so Thomas looking at, at us with that sense of joy and the presence of the risen Christ. It's just, uh, it, I will, I think I, I'll never hear that gospel, uh, that, that gospel on the second Sunday of Easter the same way again. Yeah. So thank you for that. Oh my gosh. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> just, a, we've got a few minutes left here, Car Carlo. Uh, Ruben, I'm calling you Carla. <laughs> we have a few minutes left here, Ruben. Um, what do you think 
Carlo and Thomas and the saints in general have to offer young people uh, or, or all of us in, in, in today's world? You know, we have a diverse audience here. So um, what do the saints have to offer us in today's world? I think that the saints for us as individuals, they offer us the certainty that we are all invited to God's love. No exceptions, no one is left behind. I always like to say that um, God started our um, canonization process the day we were born. So none of us are actually left behind. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how you live, doesn't matter any of that, God is always there for us. That the saints will always show us that that path is possible. They are calling us constantly to say, come and see. We should always accept the invitation, go with them and see what changed their lives so we can allow God to change ours as well. But always keep in mind that we are not copies. We have our own holiness. And Carlo Cutis has a sentence, I don't want to quote, quote because I don't know word by word, but he says something about a lot of people live as copies, but we should live as originals. So we shouldn't try to copy people just for the sake of it. May the saints encourage us to find our own path, our own gifts, our own holiness, and encourage us in that path. I always tell us a very short story. Uh, there were two fishermen fishing. One was fishing, caught a, he caught a big fish, perhaps this size. He looked at it, it was very sad, and throw the fish back into the sea. The other friend was like, oh my God, he must be crazy to throw such a big fish into the pond again. Another catch, even a bigger fish. This time <laughs> it was this big. He looked at it, it was like, so sad and throw the fish back into the water. The other one said, well, I must be missing something because he just throw two big fishes into the water. A third one, father, he just caught that fish. Huge, huge fish. He was just so upset with that. He just throw immediately the fish back into the water. The friend had to ask, why do you keep throwing all these big, great fishes back into the water? And he just replied, because at home, I only have a very small fry pan. So, and with this, I always say, don't throw away the gifts of God in our lives just because we think we are not worthy or just because we think we are in a stage in our lives that we are not fitting anywhere or we won't be accepted. God is always giving us gifts. He's always very generous. We just have to find a bigger frying pan <laughs> to adapt to the gifts that God gives us. Never throw them away. My gosh, and what a beautiful, uh, beautiful note to end on that um, the certainty that we are all invited into God's love. And the fact the idea that God has started our canonization process the day that we were born. My gosh, thank you. Um, I, I want to just, uh, I want to share with you a comment from the chat here, because I think it's a fitting way to, to, to thank you on behalf of all of us for this truly inspirational, um, beautiful, beautiful presentation that you've given us. The writer writes, I cannot thank you enough for your personal wisdom, your divine, yes, divine art, and your humor that brings us closer to God. Well, Ruben, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Again, there will be a recording uh, on our website. This will be available, us, available uh, to you to watch again. And uh, we hope that you'll take the opportunity also to see a little bit more of Ruben's work. But uh, what a blessing to have him with us tonight. And uh, God bless all of you for joining us. Thank you.